right. I know that you can multitask. You'll finish it up, even if uh, that means you got to tune me out for a minute. I'm just going to tell a really compelling story that you're going to miss, and you'll have to ask me later, now, what was that that you were talking about? <laughs> I'm Seth Cooley. I'm the family pastor, and I just really want to welcome you to Canyon View. And if this is your first time, we don't do a survey every time, so, you know. <laughs> uh, it is incredibly valuable information. I can say that after uh, pastoring for 17 years. This last week, we were down in Phoenix at, at a lot, kind of a, uh, an equipping time with the Phoenix Vineyard and, and the Columbus Vineyard. And they said, facts are your friends. Facts are your friends as, as far as somebody pastoring. We want to know because that helps to make decisions about what to do. And, and some of the things that have been really effective at our church are because of those of you who took this before. Sorry, we got new mics, so we'll try to get everything figured out here. Um, so I want to tell you about last week. We saw some really incredible, and the response to people giving coats, as I was walking into the building this morning, I saw them loading coats up to go out to our park ministry, and I ran into Landon Miracle, and he's, I said, man, you guys, like, this is a blessing. I can feel the cold air moving in. I know a storm's going to be here. If you haven't peeked at the weather for this week, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a nine on Wednesday for a low, so this was very timely, and Landon said that there were over 600 coats given. So give yourselves a hand. If you think about the ministry and, and the significance of being able to see people today and, and preparing them for this cold that's coming with a coat, it is so compassionate. And uh, this morning I was just so thankful as I look across this room and I knew that some of you sacrificed, you gave a coat that maybe you had just purchased because we took coats in service, which is something I haven't seen us do before either. And, and your response is just, it, it really is um, inspiring. And, and as we go through this series, I hope that these are things that you know, we, we identify, you know what, as a church there's part of this that we're doing really well, and we need to stay the course. We need to keep it up. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about loving the orphan and something that our church has really rallied around. And then I also hope any time that we open the Word of God, that you know what? We're transformed by that. That it, it has this weight to it that says, you know what? I, I just haven't arrived yet. And, and that's really how I felt as I prepared this message, as we're going to be talking about loving the widow today, is... Initially, I thought, you, you know, this is a topic that I'm pretty familiar with and kind of overseeing care and support in our church and uh, having befriended many widows through doing um, funerals and, and uh, things like that. And then walking that process with my own mother. Uh, my dad passed away in 2001. And for 17 years, uh, she lived as a widow before she just got married this last March. And um, yet, as I studied and as I read... I felt the gap between kind of what Jesus would ask of me and, and what I'm actually doing. And uh, so I, I really do hope that that hits you in a similar way because it brings about good things. I want to tell a quick story. When I was five years old, many of you know I grew up in a de uh, rural Delta, Colorado, and uh, I, I'm number three of five children. Well, I was five years old, and my mom was pregnant with my little brother, Benjamin. He's the last one born. And it turns out that his due date was going to fall right around my birthday. And if you've known many five-year-old boys, there's nothing quite as exciting as a birthday for a five-year-old boy. Uh, I am sure that in preparation for this birthday, I was probably roaming the house when I wasn't locked out of the house. Those of you who remember my previous stories... Um, and we had Johnny Horton just going like crazy on the, the record player. And I was probably in my Knight Rider underpants running around uh, just raising cane. But you know what happened? This is a travesty. My mother went into the hospital and we decided, you know what? It's, we're not going to have a birthday for Seth this year. And there was no party. 
and I, I was forgotten. And to this day, I will not let my little brother live it down that he cost me my five-year-old birthday party. It, this has been so damaging to his and my relationship that he became a Patriots fan. Oh. So, a funny story, and it really pales in comparison to something that we want to talk about today, but there is something to understanding feeling forgotten, uh, feeling like life is moving on without you, and I got just a glimpse of that at five years old, but that is the thing that really impressed me when I looked at Loving the Widow. I said, more than anything, there is this nature of, of sudden change brought upon a person, and they're easily forgotten. And we're going to kind of dive into why that is. And I, I just want you to join me in prayer as we ask for the Holy Spirit to come. We ask for him to minister to us individually and then as a congregation. And just how can we make a difference for someone that's feeling the weight of, of losing a loved one? So would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, oh, we come before you today. And, and God, we're just so grateful that we have a place where we can worship we have a place where we can, we can learn about your truths, and we're thankful for your word. Uh, we're thankful for the opportunities, even when they're hard, for us to, to grow in our faith. Uh, help us today as we uh, evaluate the, the ministry that we have in this church to people who are hurting and broken. And uh, for those of all the, that are with us in all walks of life, uh, that it may be something unrelated to this topic, but God, that they would feel and sense your love for them. Uh, they would know that they're in a place where uh, they're safe. And uh, Holy Spirit, we just, we ask for your ministry today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to be in the book of James. If you want to turn with me, either in your paper copy or in your smart device, either way, we're good. Uh, James chapter 1, and we're going to be in the final section of James chapter 1. And I'm going to go right to the verse that really contains what we're talking about today and even next week. And really, you could say loving the blank would be based on this idea. James 1.27 says that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and then to work on my own life, trying not to let that crazy world crush in on me. Uh, I was talking to a friend this last week, helping my mother and, and Galen move, and uh, he goes to a big church in Denver, and I won't name the church because this is a quote of a quote, but he says that his senior pastor, a well-known guy in Denver, has young men come to him all the time and says, would you pray for me to help me figure out God's will for my life? And I just don't know what God would have me do. And he says his just pat answer is, go take care of widows and orphans and then come back to me and tell me what God says to you. And it's just that simple, right? That we, we might ask, like, what is this mysterious thing that you have for us, God, and, and that we sit kind of at this position of, of stasis or inaction in, in our walk with God? And that God says, you know what? If, if you really want to do well, care for people who are forgotten. Care for them. See, God makes it really clear that our faith is not just a pondering faith, but it's an actionable faith. That faith without works is dead, right? So this isn't the saving faith. This is like, what do I do now that I'm saved? That's what we're talking about. What do I do with my life? What do I do with my resources? What do I do with my time? If you go back into that book of James, I, I grab the end verse, but this whole section from verse uh, 19 all the way through verse 27 it's about hearing and doing the word. And if you think a little deeper, this book of James, this is written by the brother of Jesus. This is somebody who knew the Jesus that we talk about all the time and understood what he would have people do. And he says some compelling things here in verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
that we don't want to be people who simply just hear good sermons. Later it says, for he... uh, For anybody that's just a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his face in the mirror, for he looks at himself and then goes away, and at once he forgets what he saw or what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be a blessed, he will be blessed in his doing. When I think about Canyon View Church, this is a place where it is really easy to begin doing. And and, and there's so many opportunities to love and to serve and to give. But yet, it's the role of elders and pastors and, and even you for your brother and sister to admonish one another. The Bible says, spur one another on into love and good deeds, uh, I've, I've ridden a horse, but never with spurs on. I just used the inside of my heel. That's good enough, right? But spurring is like this little kick that pokes you. So I hope that you are poked from this pulpit. I hope that you are uh, spurred from your cell group that you're in, or uh, maybe another ministry person, you know, somebody who's just very active comes up and, and they're just overflowing with what God's been doing through them. And you go, ah, oh, I need to do more. To love well, we need to see their plight clearly. This is something about the widows. In order to love them well, anybody that you want to minister to, we need to stop for a minute. What does God see? Think about this. By the very nature of losing one's spouse, the issue of diminishing within a body of believers in a community is a very real thing. This would apply to widows or widowers. Uh, I've got some statistics to share with you. According to the U.S. Census, one in four women that are aged 65 to 74 are widows. One in four. If they live to age 85, three out of four women are widows. The widows experience deep ongoing loss. What kind of things has a person lost Number one, it's obvious, right? A spouse. Many times this is a spouse of, of decades. And, and those of you that have been married even for five years you know how much it has changed your life. You know how much that your identity as an individual starts to, to wane. Your identity as a couple really grows. And, and I'm married to an introvert. She's married to an extrovert. There's lots of extroverted things that she gets to be involved with because of me, because I push, right? There's lots of introverted things that are so good for my soul because of her, because she pulls. And that, that can be lost in an instant with a death. The second thing is companionship, that, that we can lose that person that you're waking up to every day and that, that other um, voice in the room uh, hey, you want to go do this? Hey, you want to go, go do that? that? That's another significant loss. How about the place in a community? The identity of, you know, oh, uh, a good friend of mine. Here comes Jack and Betty Cronkite. And, and we, you know, we recognize each other in church many times by our spouses. A significant one is income. There's obviously a loss of income. But in the case of widow versus a widower, Uh, income declines 37%. This is according to a New York Times article in 2015. 37% for a widow from wherever their income is today, they lose a spouse tomorrow. They're they're almost 40% less money coming in. And and for a widower, it's about 22% of the income that's lost. And this last one, I really want to highlight this is important because we don't think in these terms. But physical touch, the the daily nature of somebody holding your hand they're putting their arm around you uh you know giving you a kiss good night and it's just gone it's gone and so how are we as a church to respond to such deep ongoing loss sometimes it seems easier to the widow or the widower to just withdraw from community and, and, and maybe the, the words are, it would just 
I, I feel like a burden. I, I don't want to trouble anybody. Um, they probably wouldn't notice, if you think about this, how much the evil one is at work in this, in, in this feeling of, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to become less than. Uh, less than what I was a week ago, less than what I was a month ago. And so we, those who are currently blessed, and, and you know this Holy Spirit has been working in your life, bringing about transformation, and you're a person who's saying, I, I just want to walk into God's will, and I, I want to do more of what God has for me. Wouldn't it be what God would have for us to say, who, who's missing? Who used to sit on your row that's not there anymore? Um, who was in your small group that you, you don't see? Um, how about a family member? For family members, this is the part where I, I got really convicted. There's five of us, you know? Can't somebody else take care of mom? And you know what I found out more than anything? She feels that burden for us as kids. She's, you know, helped us become independent and we all have our own families. And when she calls us up, you know, we're in the middle of this or the middle of that. And, and it feels like, oh, I don't want to trouble you. I don't know how many times my mom has said that to me. I don't want to bother you, um, but you need to know about this. And, you know, I, I'm just convicted about the nature of just assuming my mom is doing okay because I haven't heard from her. And yet in the scriptures, we see that we, we need to be active in our faith. Let's, um, now that we understand the plight of the widow accurately, I really want to look at the scriptures. There's a few stories. Uh, quite often, God highlights things that maybe you wouldn't catch normally. But there's a few stories about how Jesus interacted with the widow. And uh, I want to share those with you. Kind of understanding the plight of the widow, now seeing Jesus' heart for the widow, then we can come up with some action steps, okay? So we're going to move on to Luke 2. Chapter 2, verses 36 through 38. So this is uh, one of the people that was with Jesus um, and recording. Uh, Luke was a doctor, so he recorded a lot of specifics uh, that we would be able to see about Jesus' life. Uh, this is a really compelling story. This is early in Jesus' life when Jesus was being taken to the temple by Mary and Joseph. And um, this is well before he's uh, begun his ministry. But there's a story that kind of is hidden there that uh, just in conversing about this sermon, uh, Bob and I were talking about, you know what? This really is a hidden gem about God kind of highlighting a widow. Verse 36 says, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel. Don't know if I said that right, but of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. If you stop right there and do the math, you're going to assume she got married pretty young and she was only with her husband seven years. So she spent much of her life living as a widow and now at the age of 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak to, of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So she's got this gift of prophecy that the Holy Spirit has poured out on her. And God is using her powerfully to tell people of the coming king. And what a reward that she gets to be there in blessing Jesus as he's brought to the temple. Now, just coincidence? That's what I say. I don't think so. It's included in this story. And it's purposeful for Jesus to say, look at the importance that this person named Anna has. And she had the opportunity to withdraw. And we don't know all the backstory of why she's there, why she's just giving so much of herself. But we had to know that she was welcome there. We had to know that people benefited greatly and they probably told her about that. You know what? We really benefit greatly from you using your gifts in this body. And so there's a lot of things that you can infer, but I want this to be very encouraging if you're a widow or a widower and you're sitting among us and you've had that temptation to withdraw, that you would look at Anna and say, man, what a blessing Anna was. And, and what a blessing it must have been to Anna to belong and, and to be a part of this temple worship. 
See, God has this desire in our lives. Um, we talk about this in marriage and premarital all of the time. I'm not out looking for the one to get married to. And if you're not married yet, please hear me on this. This is a very another sermon, but you, you got to get this. We don't try to find the one in a spouse. The one is Jesus. Our relationship with God is first and foremost. And why is that? Because that can never be taken from you. And he is going to be there from now throughout eternity. And when Jesus is your number one and you find your number two, your, your, your life is so much more fulfilled than all the disappointment awaiting you. Uh, I'm so thankful I'm not Michelle's number one. I'm, I'm a mess, you know? And, and in many days I do think I'm probably more of a burden than a help. And I, that may just be the way it is, but... I look at Anna and I think, man, God was her one. There's no doubt that God was her number one. And we got to remind ourselves of this when we get down, when we, when we are having these conversations about extreme loss is, you know what? Jesus made this promise. I'll never leave you or forsake you. And that person is still with you. So take solace in that. Another scripture I want to point you over to is Mark chapter 12. And this is verse 41 through 44. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this called the widow's offering, but it's Jesus making note of a significant contribution and it's to his disciples. So the people who ended up writing a lot of this New Testament, they're in the room with Jesus and it says this, and he sat down, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything that she had, all that she had to live on. See, Jesus sees the widow and her contribution. And he is able to see it appropriately. So when I see what's happening in our church, and I, I would be tempted to tell you, hey, you know, this businessman came and he donated 50 brand new coats compared to, you know what, this widow came and she just bought this coat yesterday and it might be the only coat. She, and, and she put that in the offering. And those things go unnoticed all the time by us. God sees the widow. And part of how we do ministry is we see what God sees. And we speak what God speaks. And there's an incredible blessing, not just for our church, but for the widows and widowers themselves as they share from their position of hurt, from their position of loss, from their position of grief. And we just have to know every time that we accept an offering, every time that we open the doors of the church, that there is somebody giving out of not their abundance, but out of their lack, but they're still giving faithfully. In fact, as, as you think about it, this building, I just know that it's just, it's on the backs of people who have sacrificed much that we're able to worship today that we're able to celebrate some of the things in our community that we celebrate. And I just want to impress upon you today to notice what isn't normally noticed. So I have a few scriptures of caution. Whenever we look into this word, as he mentioned, looking at in, like looking into a mirror, uh, there are words within here that would really help to keep us on the straight and narrow, help to keep us out of the thorns, 1 Timothy 5.8 is one of these verses. It says, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. There was one time, only one, probably should have been way more times than that. But my mom was saying, I, I feel burdened in asking you for this. And I referenced that verse. I said, I need you to ask because the Bible commands me as a, as a family member, to take care. <laughs> right? 
It's a big deal to Jesus. So, yes, we as a church need to take care, but that does not dismiss my need to reach out and care for my mother and to check in on her. And our, our families have become so separated because of uh, the nature of travel and income. And, and it's very necessary for a church to come in and fill in the gaps. But as we fill in the gaps, you know, this is that spurring one another on to love and good deeds. Maybe you have a mother or father who's a widower or a widower. And you've been relying on the church in their area to care for them more than you should. Don't do that. God will bless you doing the right thing. But he also says that this is, this is a witness. That not doing the right thing, that's, that's some hefty words to say it's like denying the faith and that I'm worse than an unbeliever. I, I didn't write it. I, I wrote it, or I read it, right? This is Paul writing to Timothy. A guy probably in his 60s writing to a guy in his 30s saying, hey, listen, young punk, you don't need to just know this, but you got to teach this. Okay, here's another one. Galatians 6, 9 through 10. Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So another guideline for us when we're making decisions about what to do, it's easy for us to do giveaway ministry because we want to minister and, and uh, we go to people who are uh, down and out and are broken in our city. And honestly, our church is really well known for that. And I'm not saying that we stop doing that. But when I do that and I pat myself on the back or, you know, sometimes I let you do that and I pat myself on the back. And then I go home and I say, all is done. Ministry is done. The Bible's saying you need to look at those that are within your midst and you're going to give extra care for that. That that's your responsibility. As we, as we have opportunity, let's do good to everyone, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. And I think that that could, if you think about it, especially those that are within our midst, especially those within your group that you belong to, and then obviously, based on 1 Timothy, especially those within your household. It's very clear. The Bible says we're not to neglect. God wants to heal and care for widows and widowers through you. This is something that's very amazing about God, is that he uses us broken people. That he pours his blessings on us, and then he says, what are you going to do with what I gave you? Right? We talk about that all the time. But this, especially in the area of widows, I think comes about time. What, what kind of time are you willing to spend? Yesterday I was sharing um, the topic of this message with uh, somebody that I like to go running with. And, and I just mentioned that we were going to talk about loving the widow and, and he just, tears came to his eyes and he's lost his mother this year and he was so incredibly blessed by the way that her church community and those people who, who stood up at her funeral and, and they spoke of how much this meant to her as, as they told the stories. Church, it is such a great witness of the power of God when we meet the needs like for widows and widowers. Let's think in, in terms of circles because I, I want to kind of grow outwards here. So we start individually. What would God have me do individually? Then I take that burden into my group and say within a group, my group circles, how, how might we as a group maybe adopt a widow? Maybe it's welcoming a widower or a widower into your group and, and just doing a kind of go the extra mile to make sure that they're cared for um, and blessed. If we were to move outward further, so it, it would start as your household that it would go into your cell group or your small group. Then we say, what, what are we doing as a church? And, and this is different. If you sat in my shoes, there's many times people come up and say, hey, you know what our church should be doing? It should be doing that. And one of my favorite things to say is, okay, let's meet and let's talk about how you're going to help that happen. <laughs> because 
that, that's really the only way it goes about. There's so many good things we could be doing. It takes God putting a passion in your heart and then for, for you to say, I need help with this. And that's where the pastors and then the rest of the church comes alongside you and says, I'll help you with that. I care about that. I want to do something about that. Then you could go on. What if you're part of a community group like a, a Lions Club or Rotary? Uh, maybe you're, you're helping to care for the needs through your service in a community group. And last of all, it would be as a voter. Like, how am I caring for widows and the plight of widows in the way that I vote, the things that I do? Uh, you know, are they in line with the, with the word of God? What are some needs of widows? I came up with my list. I think you could also create a list. But here are just some thoughts. Number one is a need of belonging. That, that the sense of belonging, and only you and I can bring that by welcoming and saying, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, it, it means so much to me that you're sitting in this class or this group or this congregation. Uh, the next would be a financial. Many are on a fixed income, and that income's not going to grow. There's not potential. It's just, it is what it is. And so when, we've all experienced this, right? A big financial crisis comes, an expense that wasn't expected, maybe a, a, a long uh, thing of weather or something like that, right? A natural disaster, we can help financially. Physical touch. So I mentioned not, not receiving the touch of, of that companion. And so while we're not going to be there to kiss a widow or a widower goodnight, we can hug. We can reach out and take their hand and pray with them. Uh, I, I thought of our Thanksgiving meals because it's not just about providing food. So many of the people, if you've gone when we've done this Thanksgiving outreach, they're, they're people who just are not... Um, loved on enough throughout the year and and they don't have family around and so when we take this meal rather than just i'm just completing a task i brought my meal here take it and go it's like what else can i do for you and i know many of you have experienced the blessing of being able to just kind of linger with somebody who needs the presence of another person who needs the touch uh, a, a hug a pat on the shoulder a prayer that would be the next one would be prayer or care and support. Uh, give them meaningful service opportunities that we're making way. We don't, Bob is so good about telling me when I lead a Thanksgiving outreach, we're not about efficiency. You are not in a race to get this done faster than the other room. We are about giving people opportunity to serve God with their gifts. And so maybe it's slower to have, um, you know, someone do this or, or do that, but that's okay. We're, we're not just going to look at efficiency. We're going to look at meaningful service opportunities. And then last of all, widows need to be thanked and encouraged for their service. I called Jack Cronkite up. I mentioned him earlier. Many of you know Jack. He ushers here. I've known him for 17 years because he was part of the church I was part of before this. And, and Jack's just an amazing guy. And he just raved about you as a church. He said, I have been so cared for and so checked up on. And my group that I belong to came in this summer and they, they paid for a landscaper to take care of my yard. And I had a beautiful yard this year. And, and he was just... He, he was not feeling like withdrawing from community. He was not feeling like in this broken state. He was well cared for. And that's a testimony to you and to the other people. But it's also a testimony to Jack's willingness to be involved. Jack would be the first one to say, let me help with something. Let me be a part of something. And, and so we need to thank and encourage when we see that. Particularly when somebody goes through a time of loss and it's like, you know what? I really appreciate that you're here serving because it's probably hard for you. It's probably a difficult season. And what can I do to help you? Oh, what a great story. So in the ministry time today, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, stand and worship. Would you stand with me? I just wanna give you this. I, I know that God speaks his Holy Spirit through his word, through the teaching, that, that God is doing all sorts of things in this room. But would you take a posture of God, what is it that I've been missing that I need to see? We're headed into the holidays. This is a, a, this is a time of grief. This is a time of loss for people where they remember the, the good times that they had with their spouse. And, and just ask God for what he would have you do this year. Individually, what would he have, where would he have you maybe encourage your group? 
And, and then also we're going to have some words afterwards. And, and so if God's spurring you on, we'll have the opportunity for a ministry team to be up here. And, and this is a great time to connect with God, to engage with God for what he wants to do in your life today. Even if it's not even anything on this topic, we know how powerful God is. So would you worship with me?